Ladies and gentlemen, on the occasion of this virtual BMO conference, I want to welcome you on behalf of all of our employees, all of our stakeholders, uh, the Congolese government, our partner, our, our Chinese major shareholders and partners, and the 7,000 employees working at the site, building something seriously great that will last for generations. Green is good. The absence of ice and snow is good. Hydroelectric power is good. Clean concentrates without arsenic, that's good. Scalability is good. And, and having a country where people want stable employment and all of the economic benefits. This is the largest new business in the country. We all have a burden as a Canadian public company to work together to be part of the solution, not part of the global problem. And so it's really the ESG aspects of this development that makes our people most happy and makes it most deserving of your attention and long-term investment. This is an investment of which you can be justifiably proud. Before we take you to the latest developments at Kamoa Kakula, I would like to remind you that the mine we are building today is just the first of a series of multiple expansions across this incredible resource base. Ivanhoe Mines will be producing copper in under six months from an initial 3.8 million ton per annum mine and processing facility located at Kakula, which is on budget for our initial capital estimate of $1.3 billion. We have around 400 million US remaining to spend from January 2021 to first concentrate, which will be funded 50% by Ivanhoe Mines and 50% by our partner, Zijin Mining. Given the impressive progress that the team has made in developing the underground mining operation at Kakula, but also at the Kansoko mine, we have already taken the decision to double the milling capacity by mid-2022. At this point, the mine will produce in excess of 400,000 tonnes per year of copper, ranking as one of the largest copper mines in the world. With a mine head grade in excess of 6% copper, the mine will produce significant cash flow. But the story doesn't stop there. Over the coming years, Kamoa Kakula will continue to expand in identical modules of 3.8 million tonnes per annum, bringing online additional mining areas. Firstly, an expansion of the Kamsoko mine, followed by Kakula West, the Bonanza Zone, and several mines in the Kamoa North area. At this point, Kamoa Kakula will produce in excess of 700,000 tonnes of copper per annum. These expansions can all be funded using cash flows from the initial high-grade mining operation. Of course, we also continue to explore for more high-grade copper, both on the Kamoa Kakula mining license and our neighboring 100% owned Western Foreland exploration ground. What makes DRC an attractive investment destination is obviously its, its exceptional mineral wealth. The DRC has a number of world-class deposits across a range of minerals going from gold over tin, zinc, copper, cobalt, lithium, uh, and so forth. If you take a longer term view, which we tend to do as a mining company, obviously, then you must acknowledge that things are going in the right direction. If you look at political trends, for example, at, in the last century, you had the same individual ruling the country for a period of 32 years, Ubuntu Sisi Seko, whereas now in the last 12 years, you had three presidential elections being organized, and in 2019, peaceful handover of power between presidents of different political parties. If you look at it from an economic perspective, and specifically at mining economy, at the turn of the century, the DRC was producing less than 100,000 tons of copper per year, whereas over the past few years, it consistently exceeds 1 million tons of copper. So the long-term trends are really pointing in the right direction. And if you start looking forwards, you're projecting yourself towards the future, you can only conclude that the DRC's strategic importance for the African continent and for the world uh, will be increasing, and that is linked to the African and global climate change agenda. Because the DRC uh, has a lot of contributions to make, to start with, for example, the forests of the Congo Basin, which are about 250 million hectares of forest, and which uh, on a yearly basis uh, absorb 750,000 tons of uh, CO2 emissions, which is approximately 2% of the total emissions uh, worldwide uh, on a yearly basis. 
if you uh, look at the DRC's hydro potential, it's estimated at around 100,000 megawatts. You can see how big a player the DRC will be in terms of clean energy generation on the African continent. And lastly, obviously, coming back to the mineral endowment, a lot of the other minerals that are essential for the clean energy transition are present in DRC and are present at high grades, which means that the environmental footprint per tonnage can be significantly less than in some other geographies. When you look at the ownership structure of Camoa Copper, it is in essence a global company in which North and South and East and West join hands. At the Camoa Copper level, it is in essence a joint venture between the DRC government, which owns 20%, and Camoa Holdings owning 80%. And then Camoa Holdings in and of itself is a joint venture, uh, in essence a 50-50 joint venture between Zijin Mining and Ivano Mines. Zijin Mining is a Chinese mining group and Ivano Mines is listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange with major shareholders such as Citic, Zijin, but also institutional investors such as BlackRock, Fidelity, Invesco and others. Well, investors should get involved in Camoa Copper SA first and foremost because they want to be part of making history. It is a company with an exceptional mining asset that is only matched by the exceptional quality of the people building the project. Welcome to Kamoa Copper. This year, 2021, we'll see a key milestone being achieved with the first copper in concentrate being produced. Kamoa Copper has currently an estimated staff complement of 7,000 people, including our contractors' employees. Our concession spans over an estimated footprint of 400 square kilometers. Currently, the monthly underground development is done at a rate of just below 3,000 meters. Please join us as we start a new chapter in the story of Kamoa's development from exploration, mine, to market. You're standing in a primary drift that's been broken away about a month ago. It's one of our very first stoping drifts that we started mining. And I'd like to show you the actual drift so you can have a look at the hanging wall and see what a 10 meter in actually looks like. So 10 by seven and a half. If you blast it, it gives you close to a thousand tons per blast, depending on the advance that you select. All of us are very excited about the ramp up and even more the grade that's coming out of this ore body at the moment. 11% copper in these areas is, is unique. So the mining method that we employ at Kukula is drift and fill. It's a method that allows us to extract a very large proportion of the ore body, so above 90% of the ore body. And it's a pace fill. So you, you do your primary, secondary and tertiary drifts, which are all backfilled with pace fill. If you compare that to another mining method, for example, board and pillar, you'll have extraction rates, depending on depth, of about 50, 60, 70% at the most. What sets Kamoa Kukula apart is the fact that we have the two things. We have scale, but we also have grade. We've got a very, very high grade asset with the scale. So 40 million tons of copper is not a small asset, and the grade is fantastic. All our grades are between 4 and 6%. So even our lower grade asset, which is at Kansoko, is 4.5% copper. And then we've got Kukula, which is running over 6%. So the current production numbers that we're sitting on now is basically the phase one. We are in and around 300,000 tons per month, which is what we were aiming for to get to the first phase, which is 3.8 million tons a year. So we're very close to that already. Moving forward, we are gonna be commissioning the second phase, which is the next plant, the next module, to take us to 7.6 million tons. We are currently sitting on a stockpile of about 2 million tons of medium and high grade. So our intention is to grow that to about 3 million tons by July, which is when the first module runs at 3.8 million tons, and then to grow it a little bit more so that when you run the second module in July next year, you have a fantastic start to your commissioning and also to your ramp up. It takes a lot of pressure off the underground mining teams and allows you to mill with a lower operating cost for a year, pretty much a year. So I think that's great. And then going forward, 
we will get the two plants running at steady state and then the mine obviously needs to run at steady state in 2023 odd. So beyond the first two phases of the 7.6 million, there will be subsequent expansion here. We will have to erect a copper smelter and the timing of that I think is about 2024 where we will be producing in excess of 400,000 tonnes of copper, 800,000 tonnes of concentrate. That needs to run. The smelter will need to run because of the logistics. Absolutely a huge amount of copper to export. So in terms of tailings management, we've taken a very low risk approach to how we manage tailings. Starting off, it's a very small environmental footprint that we create because we return 60% of our tailings back underground. And beyond that, we've taken a downstream approach so there just isn't that risk of flooding down into your communities because it's a downstream design, which gets independently managed and monitored. So I think besides it being a very tiny footprint of about 2,000 tonnes per day compared to some of the big operations that run 200,000 tonnes of tailings per day, we manage it environmentally very well, with both through design and through independence. As a world-class project, we not only had to ensure that we comply with global best practice, but also to procure the world's most efficient and reliable equipment. This procurement strategy is evident if you look at the equipment on our site. For example, the 300 cubic meter flotation cells fabricated by Autotech, our ball molds fabricated by Citic, a leading Chinese company, and then our backfill plant is equipped with state-of-the-art equipment like the Putzmeister high-pressure pumps. Looking at our underground mining equipment, leading manufacturers Sandvik, Epiroc and Normit supplied our LSDs, dump trucks and drill rigs. These are the largest and the most efficient in the world and are able to be fully automated in future. Kamoa is very proud to be a green mine. A recent audit performed by Hatch confirmed that Kamoa Kekula will be among the world's lowest green gas emitters per unit of copper produced. Initially, processing will be done by means of milling and flotation circuits. The concentrate that will be produced will be bagged and shipped to a third party off taker. The long term plan for Kamoa is to build a smelter complex on site and produce blister copper, which will be sold to the market. The smelter will also produce sulfuric acid that will be sold locally. Due to the nature of Kamoa Kakula concentrate, the Autotech direct to blister smelter technology will probably be used. Phase one of the concentrator has a design capacity of 3.8 million tons per annum, or approximately 500 tons per hour. The combination circuit has three phases, crushing, HPGR, and then two overflow bore mills in series. Material from the mills is then pumped to the flotation section, which has roughers, scavengers, and cleaners, a portion of the concentrate is reground and recleaned. Concentrate is thickened, filtered, bagged, and then sold to the market. Phase two of the concentrator, which is currently in construction, is basically a doubling of capacity, except for the front end, which is originally designed for the full phase two capacity. The phase two capacity is 7.6 million tons, or approximately 1,000 tons per hour. Kamoa has very unique metallurgical characteristics. Of course, the head grade is very high with areas in the ore bodies containing up to 8% copper. The ore mineralogy is chalcocyte dominant, which will enable us to produce a very high concentrate grade. Kamoa Kakula concentrate has very low arsenic level at 0.01%. Most Chinese smelter reject concentrate with arsenic level in excess of 0.5%. And we're very fortunate that our Kamoa Kakula concentrate is well below that range. Aveno Mine Energy was created by the shareholder of Kamoa Copper as a specialized entity with a mandate to identify and develop capacity to power this world-class asset. We then entered into a public-private partnership with the national utility, Snell, to work together to strengthen the grid's capacity. At this stage of our cooperation, we are about to complete the refurbishment of Mwadingusha Hydroelectric Power Station with state-of-the-art technology in terms of controls and instrumentation. Sufficient power will be generated 
to take us through to production and more so to meet the power requirement of Kamoa Copper for phase one and phase two of its development. At this stage of construction, Kamoa Copper demand stands at 14 megawatt. This will increase with the commissioning of the concentrator to reach 50 megawatt by the end of 2021. Our contribution into strengthening the grid capacity will generate more power than required for operational reasons. Excess power will stay in the grid to serve the communities. And as we know, access to power is a key factor in stimulating economic growth. The upgrade of the Modingusha hydroelectric power station, which consists of six turbines, will be completed in the second quarter of 2021. Besides the replacement of the turbines, the scope of the refurbishment work at Modingusha included 70 kilometers of access road, water treatment plant, medical care facility, and all the required equipment and infrastructures. Snell and Ivanhoe Mines Energy have identified an additional refurbishment opportunity at Inga 2 hydroelectric power station in the western part of DRC. Kamawa will be producing 800,000 tons of copper concentrate per annum, which will be transported by road through three border posts to Durban, taking approximately 45 days for a round trip. We also have the potential to use Dar es Salaam in Tanzania and Walfus Bay in Namibia. In the long term, we will be unlocking the Western Corridor in Angola, which is endorsed by the African Union and supported by the governments of DRC and Angola. We are also looking at a strategic project on the Southern Corridor to enhance logistics on road and rail. Thirty years ago, if you were walking over this ground, uh, you would look at the rocks, you'd be disappointed because they're the wrong rocks, and you would move off. What Ivanhoe said was, well, even if the unit that doesn't normally host the copper, if that's not present here, if the fluid is still moving through this area, it would find another rock type to mineralize. And that kicked off geophysical surveys, uh, ground surveys, soil sampling, and very subtle hints of copper were found. And it wasn't until we got underneath the cover and drilled down that we discovered the deposit. 200 meter step out, still there. 400 meters, still there. And that's so the drilling expanded. And we found that this deposit was thick, relatively flat and laterally continuous. This was very exciting. And as the drilling progressed, the resource grew and grew. And by 2014, we had a large resource, over 700 million tons, close to 800 drill holes. And this is where I love the Ivanhoe approach, is the geologists went to senior management and said, we've done all this drilling, we have a huge resource, can we keep going? We think there are other areas that are prospective. And we continued south, and that's when we made the Kukula discovery, a zone that's even higher grade than what we had discovered at Kamoa. And then that has been a game changer for this project. But what sets it apart from the Congolese and Zambian deposits is it's high grade. We get zones of five, 6% copper, not for one year, not for two years, for the entire mine life, we're mining these high grades. So the indicated resource at Kamoa Kukula is particularly large. At a 1% cutoff, it's nearly 1.4 billion tons at 2.74% copper. That's 38 million tons of contained copper. But remember, it's the high grade that sets these deposits apart. At a 3% cutoff, Kamoa Kukula contains 423 million tonnes at 4.68% copper. The Kamoa Kukula mining licence is very large and we haven't explored the entire licence. But adjacent to the licence, we own 2,500 square kilometres of additional exploration ground and we are expanding our exploration into that area. We're moving into the broad land package that is the Western Foreland. A land package of this size requires techniques where we can collect large data quickly. Geophysical surveys, ground sampling surveys, techniques that we know work. And we will use the results of these surveys to target higher grade zones that we will test with drilling. I found that there is a unique culture in the DRC. The people like to work. They have a work ethic that's excellent. There's an eagerness to learn. 
which is good because we are creating jobs that are valuable. I believe that they're internationally relevant and transferable in the longer term. So where we do training, we're doing training on automation, we're doing training on mechanization. The objectives of the training center is to provide an opportunity for our Congolese employees to gain skills in mining, concentrator and engineering maintenance. This will allow for our employees to have the opportunity to get into more skilled jobs and also increase their earning potentials. A good example of people benefiting from the training center is Kamoa's first class of female underground operators, which further demonstrates Kamoa's commitment to gender balance. The people from our surrounding communities benefit from job opportunities, Kamoa Copper, by investing in our people, reaps the immediate benefit of having a local labor force. And lastly, the training center working in conjunction with the DRC government to reach their objectives of reducing the unemployment rate and boosting the local economy. We also have a transformation program in place, which was designed to identify and develop our top talent within the organization to create a talent pool to fill our managerial and specialized senior positions. Even with the impact of COVID, we've managed to claw back time on the project and keep things on track, which I think is quite unique. I think it's just a fantastic team that we work with. We have managed to actually deliver really well under extremely difficult times. Kamoa's proudest moment with regards to health was the achievement of the completion of phase one of our Kamoa hospital. We used this during COVID-19 as an ICU, and we've been able to adapt it to additional patient care. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the accelerated rate at which Kamoa was able to progress at was largely due to the risk-based approach that we followed as a management team in executing on the requirements globally. Kamoa's strategic approach to health and safety has been one that focuses on our people and the ownership that they take of their daily tasks. We have focused on rolling out the digitalization of our strategies and using our advanced systems to achieve this at every level. We consider ourselves as corporate citizens because this is our home. We abide by international standards, but we have developed projects that speak to specific needs of our host communities. We have integrated ethical and transparent corporate governance across all the departments, tried to raise the bar for ESG. The Sustainable Livelihood Initiative are strategically developed to achieve the sustainable development goals like gender equality, economic growth, and eradicating hunger. Our initiatives are responsible for uplifting small-scale farmers into lead farmers with an increased production capacity, setting a model for future generations. For example, the vegetable producers have increased their revenue from $3,000 to $300,000. The Kamoa Enterprise Development Program reinforces the current mining business model, which embraces sustainable economic development through entrepreneurship, all of which creates goods and services which can be sold back to the mine. We are particularly proud of the sewing, which is majority women, and we aim to create gender balance. Our next generation of entrepreneurs will come from these communities and their Sussex stories become part of Kamoa legacy. Kamoa complies with IFC principles attributed to social licensing, such as early stakeholder engagement, clear communication, and long-term vision. At Kamoa, we understand that the success of our operation can only be achieved with the support of our host communities. We are dedicated to embracing their empowerment. The Kamoa Social Investment Program is enclosed into the Cahiers de Charge, which defines initiatives regarding education, health, agriculture, and infrastructure. This achievement is the result of honest and open communication with our host communities. At Kamoa, we are proud to work together, transforming lives. It's an absolute privilege to work on an asset like this. It's, an, it's a tier one project, it's a tier one resource. You're not gonna see anything like this easily in the world. It's so scalable. I think what's lying ahead for us now, right now, in the next few months, is really just to make sure that we hit the numbers that we've promised our stakeholders, 
The other thing I think that's important is to create a culture, the right culture here. Besides hitting milestones and hard targets, we here in the DRC, we need to make sure that the stakeholders, the communities, the government, the employees and ourselves can build a culture that is different to some of the other companies with all due respect, that we create a culture of inclusiveness and that we work together 